I don't like being in hospital. I suppose it's better than being homeless, isn't it? I mean, I don't like being watched. What makes this one the best? Because the way I, I got stripped for one not very nice. I'm, I'm trying my hardest. I really am. So I don't need to know all. I don't need to know my story. But this, this is this, this is a bit thin for me. Out of all the hospitals I've been in, this is the best one out of the staff that have been, uh, they've been helpful. I don't like ADTs, do I care no. now? Or CPHs? No. Well, they're a bit nerve-wracking, aren't they? Oh, yeah. You think at first, like, being locked in, it, it's hard, it's a bad thing, but it actually gets you into momentum and good stead. Being able to go and only, um, you know, so, uh, and that was very good. And, and I thanked um, Karen, Karen Perry and, and Laura White, mm -hmm. you know, for taking me home and it, I had such a smashing day. Mm -hmm. Women, all women need, we need love. So we need time with, you know, time with our family. Because uh, I know he's always there, but if, if he needs me, I'm always there for him. He's mm -hmm. um, a treasure to have. I think mm, we should be in love with females, no males. Don't you say? Just look around and go mommy's and do me shopping there when I start doing my husband. Uh, all I do is knitting and sewing and gardening, that's it. I prefer sewing and baking as well. Mm -hmm. All I do meal prep, that's another one. With your, yeah. Techniques, like using my comfort box, using eyes. What do you what, like about the service? Help me with my physical health. Help me lose weight. And how have you done that? Walking. Exercise and walking, that's good. Uh, helping me. Um, getting me better to move on. What your risks are, they, they, they prevent them. Yeah. So, it does, it does help in them ways. You've just had your blackboard put up in your room as well. Why wow, does that help? To draw my feelings on it. Dr Schilling is quite good really. He is, he does. He's alright. To um, go on, on different trips. I, I, I only thing I think of, what I think this place would benefit in, is like a matter to relax our muscles. Because a lot of us are on medication which tense our muscles up. Yeah. You, you all should get a pay rise. No male staff, just females. I'd like a social worker, who, someone with contacts, you know what I mean, to help me. Yeah. You know what I mean? that's, that's all I can really say. Not just someone who, who says, it's not just a say a doer. So far, so far, I just want me on flat. I love animals. Move me and my family. I'm, I'm, I'm get a house of my own. Get me some back again. Hopefully, meet someone nice. And to the, then settle down again. A nice boyfriend. Yeah, I've always been saying I want to go back to see if we can roll camp there. I shouldn't be in this one. Go out and maybe more, yeah, for people and spend more time with family. Don't look too far ahead because it's daunting. Mm. Um, I just take each day as it comes and just baby steps, little steps, because I, I am diagnosed with autism, Asperger's, and, yeah. and I. If I had to overwhelm myself and take a lot in, 
I just think, oh, I can't do it, I fail at first hurdle. Yeah. I'd like to introduce our sp first speaker, uh, Georgie Parry Crook. Um, Georgie is from the Tavistock uh, Institute and London Metropolitan University. Um, she is a social scientist and has led on a number of evaluations of service provision um, for women in hospitals and secure settings. Uh, so please welcome Georgie. Thank you very much. Can I go now? That's yeah. kind of that was the, the important bit. Um, and I'm so reassured by the technical hitches. These sorts of things make me feel much better. Because uh, if I fall over or do something really silly, I won't feel I'm sort of the first of the day, um, quite. Um, can you hear me? No. OK. Um, I will... I'll try and... Do you have a slide changer by any chance? No, it's OK. I, I, actually, I'll wander back to it, so... I'll just... Turn, that's right, because I, I know when they're going to come. I don't want to have to keep asking. OK, that's great. Um, I'll try to speak from somewhere around here. Is that, is that better? Yeah, I'll do my best. OK. Um, thank you very much indeed to Lighthouse uh, Healthcare for inviting me to be here this morning. Um, as um, Haley has said, I'm an evaluator. Um, I should warn you, I'm not a clinician, so I don't know if I have any credentials in some ways to be here. But I first got involved in working in services doing research and evaluation with services, working with women um, from about 1999. And I've continued to work in a number of different ways and indeed have had sort of the pleasure of meeting women again and again as they have moved through um, some of the service provision. Um, I'm really hoping that some of you are also going to bring me up to speed with kind of the most recent issues, concerns, and I'm going to try and make sure that we've got a bit of time before the end of my slot because I'd love to hear from people, and I expect there's quite a lot of experience that could be shared in the room. I just wanted to note that the only reason that I am here today is thanks to the many women who have taken part in some of the research and evaluation projects I've worked on. And that's been about 150 that I've actually talked with, met, had discussions with, met more than once. Um, which has been a real privilege for me. So in a sense, I'm just a, a conduit for what they have told us as researchers. I also think it's really important to acknowledge the staff and other professionals. And I have quite a strong feeling that in quite a lot of research and evaluation that is undertaken, very often the focus, and quite rightly, is on what are the outcomes for the recipient of services. And of course, that's what we want to know. And for many of you, it will be wanting to know about the clinical outcomes as well as the social outcomes and what happens to women. I think it's really crucial to understand all the different factors that make a difference to how women can or cannot achieve what they're hoping to achieve. And that comes down to staff and all the other people who are involved in the provision of their care. So again, I'm hugely grateful. I've talked with about 200 um, different professionals over the years, and it's been immensely um, rewarding and, again, a huge privilege. Um, I don't know if any of you listened to Women's Hour this week, but it's 70 years since it began this week, I believe. And one of the things that was in the very first episode was a woman that you're nodding there saying they, they, they had a clip from it, which was, we really do advise, this is best BBC voice, we really do advise women to powder their noses. It will make you feel better and your family will feel better about you. <laughs> which I thought was wonderful. In 1999, um, a colleague of mine, Penny Stafford, who's also been um, a service user in secure services, wrote a report for an organisation called WISH, which was Women in Secure Hospitals. And again, I'm sure some of you are very familiar with their work. They are still working in secure services with women. And Penny, in that report, not very long ago, wrote, women are still expected to look pretty, speak quietly, act gently, and if we deviate from such behaviour, we are often judged as bad or mad or both. Quite a lot has changed since then, 
So the first piece of work that I was involved in, I met a lot of women who were in the then high support, high secure women's services, one of whom talked about coming to Broadmoor in 1977, which at the age I'm at now doesn't seem that long ago, really, and talked about, she said, when you came here, there was a loo round and you all queued at once. For the washroom, you then had to strip off and quite a few times a man was present. It has changed for the better. And I think it's really important to kind of say some of that um, because they're, they're, it's quite easy, and I'm sure some of you who work within services or have been perhaps around this block for quite a long time, it's quite easy to focus on what's not working. And actually what has changed is very important. And, and a lot of the women I've met, particularly those that were in high secure so, um, services, so that was Broadmoor, Ashworth, and then the previous Rampton service, actually did talk about very positive change in their experience. So what I'd like to do is to, um, in the time that I have, and I am keeping, okay. keeping an eye on the time. That's better, that's working. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about three really key areas. And when we were discussing this, um, in terms of the presentation, although the presentation I'm giving is really about what happens to women who are leaving secure services in the main. And I know that one of the workshops that Stella will be doing um, is going to be also looking at some of those kind of what happens to women and concerns. It seemed to me it was quite important to not just think about the stepping out aspect of it, because the stepping out is also contingent on how you arrive in a secure mental health setting, how you move through it, and then how you might move on from it. So those are the three areas that I'd just like to focus on for the next 20 minutes or so. It's not going to be the numbers. There's a lot of research. Well, there's not, actually. There's a lot of research in some areas and very little in others. You can find that. There are references on the presentation. I'm not going to give you the numbers. I think that's, from my perspective, not a very exciting thing to do at 10 to 10 in the morning. Um, I want to tell you something more about what the issues appear to have been, the ways in which they have or haven't been addressed, and what there still is, really, to be thinking about. Just also to set the scene, a little bit about the terms that I've been using, and this has been very much part of my work, and thinking about how we define and there's something about, you know, defining women. And actually, it's not always obvious. It might seem very obvious. But again, I'm sure many of you will be thinking that, well, no, it isn't. Because the women we're talking about here are going to very often be women who've experienced high levels of abuse, domestic violence, child sexual abuse, and often, actually, the inequalities that life throws at us. So they're not just women in a kind of, in a group, um, and in the same way that, you know, many of us in the room are women today, but we're not all the same. When talking about secure services, over the years there have been different definitions as they've been changing. They are very much about providing treatment for people, and very often that's going to be people, and in this case that I'm talking about women for today, those that are at risk of harming themselves or others. And then it becomes more nuanced because we've got the high, the medium, the medium enhanced, and the low secure. Complex needs. I think in the title of today, we've got complexity. Complexity is such a, a big word. And of course, everything becomes part of that. But the whole concept of people having complex needs <coughs> is very important. So multiple needs, to, and not necessarily just dual diagnosis, but all those kind of multiple factors that actually make a difference to how someone arrives at, moves through, and then steps out from a secure service. I'm going to talk a little bit about high support services and what that might mean. And for many women who have actually had access to the limited amount of high support residential care that's available. This is about 24-hour support. It's about relational security. It's about all the things that you'll be familiar with. Therapeutic, based around the recovery model, taking positive approaches. And then the concept of community and a lot of the literature and a lot of the experience I've had of talking with people has focused on, well, you know, it's about the community. Well, what is the community? And again, I think there's something about being able to define community. We want women to move to the community. But what does that mean? Whose community? What community? 
how is it constituted, where does it come from. It's actually, again, more nuanced and more complex than just saying the community. So stepping in, this is an old picture. Um, I think it's probably the exterior of Broadmoor. And I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure <laughs> of visiting. I spent quite a lot of time there in 1999. Um, it was a very interesting experience, not just for meeting the women there and some of the staff, but just the whole process of even going to Broadmoor actually has raises a lot of things. And for me, one of the, one of the main things was um, the work that came out of it we entitled Good Girls. And part of it was because not only were the women talking about that, but to get in, we had to behave on the door. And so one of my first experiences was I would arrive in the morning and somebody at reception would say, good morning, darling. This would, I have to say, usually be a man. And I would just go, hello. And I was probably at a stage in my life where somebody else could have said that to me, perhaps in the street. And I would have said, I'm not your darling. So it was a very interesting way to start my um, work in this area. So just a little bit then about history. And if you can't hear me because I've moved slightly back, then do say, um, I just need to be close to this. So what we've got is... Um, it's well, reasonably well known. There's quite a lot of literature which shows that women are more often going to be transfers from other hospitals, moving between secure units. Um, quite frequently, it's about non-criminalized behavioral disorders. So there isn't necessarily an index offense of any kind. And various kinds of diagnoses that would be given or labels, if you like previous criminal convictions than men, more likely to get a primary diagnosis of personality disorder. And the quote from the author of this says, these differences suggest that new specialist therapeutic regimes for women are needed. Future research should examine their needs for internal and perimeter security and compare their needs with those of men. And this was actually um, work by Jeremy Coyd and others from 2000. And they and many others are still saying some very similar things. So as I said, a lot has changed. And there are some things that have not changed perhaps as quickly as we would like. So the whole process of going in and becoming a, um, a patient, a service user, um, a recipient of services is still, has still got some of these issues. So very quick run through. I don't really want to, to, to spend much time on this. But thinking about some of the history um, of these women, it was in 2000 that Secure Futures for Women Making a Difference was published into the mainstream, which is possibly in relation to women and secure services, the documentation, the documents, the policy and the guidance that many of us pinpoint as a turning point uh, for what happened to women's services. So very influential. 2003, the implementation guidance, um, various changes that were taking place. Um, so a, a commitment to reducing or changing and therefore closing the high uh, secure women's services. And in 2006, all the women from Broadmoor moved out. Rampton opened its new women's service. 2007, Women's Enhanced Medium Secure Services were established. And so we go on. In 2008, and through into the mainstream, there was a commitment to, and the beginning of development of what were going to be four high support residential, sorry, high support therapeutic residential community-based services for women with complex needs. Nobody ever came up with a shorter title um, than that. But I guess it's trying to say it all. That's what it was going to be. Um, by 2009, there were 27 independent and NHS medium secure services for women, um, many of which had a gender-specific care pathway. And again, some of you will know this, that it was also a period when there was a lot of training being developed for staff about gender sensitivity, gender awareness, and that that was being taken around the country to prisons and to secure mental health services. Concepts around relational security began to really emerge, if you like, in print. I think this was happening, but it hadn't, the term hadn't been coined until 
2007, 2008, and then in 2010, the Department of Health published um, their guidance to relational security in women's secure services. And then there have been changes since then around women offenders, the women offender uh, personality disorder strategy, and that's included a number of different developments, one of which is the Primrose program at Low Newton Prison, for example. So these, this kind of history looks quite straightforward. Um, it's also got some policy and political elements to it. And I think that this has really been very important in the way in which services have or have not developed. So putting gender on the agenda back in 1999, 2000 was still quite a political activity. And I say that with a small p, but it was something about saying, and it wasn't just coming from women, of course, it was coming from people who were working with women, saying women's experiences are different. We need to look at how we have gender-specific services and pathways for women that actually acknowledge and take note of that. Um, I mentioned to you Good Girls, which was the report that where I started working on this um, and was, came out in 2000. <laughs> And what women talked about then was a, was a lot about being expected to behave as adults, being treated like children, and then also about towing the line. What they also talked about, without having the terminology, was what we would now talk, see as relational security. They almost preempted that concept. And yet at that point in time, most of those women were going nowhere and not a lot was changing. Into the mainstream that I've mentioned, its impact, and then I think since then, with the growth of um, the independent sector in the provision of secure services, and a lot of the services for women have come through the independent sector, we can't not acknowledge that there are market forces. Independent organisations are essentially private ones. They will need to generate resources in a different way to the NHS. And that has probably had an impact so that's, again, a sort of economic, if you like, small p political impact on how services develop and ways in which women do or do not move through them. In 2013, the Women's Secure Strategy was produced forwards together. And that, again, has been something that has been considered to be a very important um, policy uh, innovation, but not one that has seemed to really come into practice. So once you're there and you want to step through, this is a kind of modern, unspecified, brand new, medium secure service, I would say. So women's experience of multiple deprivation and abuse that I've mentioned, the social inequalities that affect women's lives, and often carrying the stigma of being a patient in a secure setting, is part of what shapes what we do, what we provide, but also the societies that we live in shape what we do and what we provide. So it's not just that these are people who have very particular needs and we want to do something about that to help them, to be part of recovery for them, but there is also something about other factors in society which will help to shape that. And they're not always necessarily the most positive, and that comes through the way services develop. So women's experience, um, some of them will be coming from other institutions, from outside a, ser a service, so they're new to it. There's a range and a wide scope of the kinds of interventions, the treatments and therapies that are being offered. There are questions always to be considered and are considered about governance and about user involvement. And these are all relatively recent considerations, if you like. And then there's what's of value to women. And certainly most of the research that has been published and the work I've been involved in and just talking to providers and women themselves is, yeah, they really do want women-only services. And that's in the main what we have. When, again, in 1999, early 2000s, there were mixed wards, there were single women on wards that were populated by men. In the great days of Broadmoor, they had mixed discos, which women talked to us about as being very difficult because they had many of them experienced some sort of sexual abuse 
and they knew that they would be mixing with men who might have been involved in sexual offences. So women-only services became a very important part of their experience. And then these ideas of talking, of being, of forming relationships became absolutely essential to what they would want. There's also, I think, a question here which affects stepping out, which affects those outcomes for women, and that's about system change. So it's not, it is about the individual, and that's part of the complexity, and it's about what the system changes are that actually bring about better outcomes, if you like. And of course, not all women are going to move from secure services. They move across, they may move between different level, levels, but actually the systems that support that are very important. So the changing models, philosophies of care, if you like, what are the keys to recovery? What kinds of barriers are there? And there are barriers, and a lot of that does relate to things like staff, lack of staff, lack of time, sometimes lack of awareness, maybe a lack of support. Through all of the pieces of work that I've been involved in, staff have talked about not always getting to supervision, not always having time, having to do extra shifts because of lack of staff. So a number of system issues which really impact then on the success or otherwise of what's going to happen. The whole concept of relational security has involved system change. It's required looking at physical security, shifting the locus of power, shifting towards women's strengths and not weaknesses. And that's been a process. It's not something that happens overnight. It's about embedding that in the services. And then the experience, as I mentioned before, for staff, recruitment, development, support and supervision. And all of these things are going to be the factors which contribute to what happens to that single woman or those, that group of women who might be looking towards discharge, moving, moving into independent living in the community. So I think that that's a really important aspect of it. What happens in the reality is there's quite a lot of tangled pathways. And um, because things don't work, Ideally, they don't always work in ways that we would want them to work. There isn't necessarily a linear and easy way to bring about that transition from a secure service to something different. And I think that it can mean what happens is you get two steps forward, could be sideways, it could be back. And again, some of that is affected by the system rather than by what the individual woman has been doing. So I can think of, um, there was a woman I met in Broadmoor who during another piece of work I came across in a medium secure service, and uh, which was great. I feel really lucky to have just happened upon several women who I have seen move through to independent living. I haven't seen them through, but I have seen them during that process. And this was someone who, in the medium secure unit, was saying, I have been told now that I'm absolutely ready. You know, everybody is behind it. Everyone's clear. There just isn't anywhere for me to go. There just isn't anywhere for me to go. So there is a kind of utopian vision, if you like, a managed clinical network that incorporates all levels of secure provision, community mental health services and healthcare provision within, this was about the prison estate, but it was referring to secure mental health services as well. And again, this is not that new, but we're still saying it. This was, um, some of you may have come across Mary DeLustro, who is a um, consultant psychiatrist who works with women. And that was in 2004. That system change then is still really an important part of where people are looking. And if you look then towards care pathways, consideration and the variation is huge, both from staff experience and from women's experience. There isn't a single thing called a care pathway. There's a concept, a roadmap is how somebody described it. Ideally, it's seamless it will contribute to recovery and care planning. And then you raise all those sorts of questions of, well, who's deciding? Is it women-centered? Is there agreed understanding? And is there one size that fits all? Which is probably very questionable. 
And certainly when I've worked, talked with women who have left secure services and are living in the community, one of the most difficult aspects for them has been about seeing that there is anything near seamlessness in the care pathway. So that's the tangle, entanglement, if you like, of what's happening. So barriers then are placement availability, often absence of trial periods, and for the perhaps quite small number of women, but women who do um, move on, who want to move on and are in a position to do so, because of all those systemic issues, if you like, that I've mentioned, it's really difficult to do the perfect thing. So again, one of the um, high support residential services, women there talk to us about wanting better, longer periods to make that transition. And staff talked about it too. Why can't the women come and stay for a night, for two nights, then for three nights, then maybe a week, get to know people, set up with a buddy, and then they make the move. But logistically, it just wasn't, and resource-wise, it just wasn't going to be possible. And that question then about the transition and the ongoing support. How am I doing for time? OK. So if those are some of the barriers that already existed, what then happens in that stepping out process? Um, some work by Annie Bartlett, and again, some of you will be familiar with her work. It's very kind of grounded, readable, accessible um, discussions and research about what's happened to women in secure services. And this was in 2014, and she and her colleagues were discussing in a paper where and when should women be dis discharged. And the clinicians, they were talking to clinicians, and it's one of the, the rare pieces of work I've seen where actually those professionals, the staff, were involved in talking about what, where they thought this was coming from. And they said, well, probably most of the people, the women they were working with, you know, 50% could be discharged within one year. And um, that was in the NHS. In the independent <coughs> sector, the clinicians they talked to were less likely to recommend a change. So they would say, well, we'll, you know, keep this these women at the same level of security. The reality, actually, is that a higher proportion of women are discharged more quickly from the independent sector than they are from the NHS. Now, I leave that to you to think about why that might be, but there could be all sorts of factors, again, which are to do with systems, economics, or just the way in which different people work. And these were a limited number of clinicians, so not all clinicians working in all uh, organizations. Then thinking about where women are discharged, um, were they discharged? So um, this piece of work was about medium secure services, 2009. And at that point, um, only 10 of the women who were discharged in a, a period of a year were into community settings, which is a very low proportion given the changing philosophies, the changing models of care and the changing interest in how women could, when it's appropriate, move to a community-based setting. And then 16 were moved to other medium secure units. So what's going on then? If there's a commitment, there's a change, all these changes have taken place in understanding in gender-specific pathways, in awareness, relational security, accepting, acknowledging that many of the women who are actually um, part of the secure system are there because they may be a greater risk to themselves than they're a risk to anybody else. They won't necessarily have an index offence. What's going on? So then we have to think about, well, what's out there? And some women do step sideways, and that's not necessarily a negative it can actually be a very positive, and again, I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's too easy to see it as negative, but if it's going to be the more appropriate, the better, the more useful to that woman, then that can happen. And there might be a shift in what they need. It might also be about um, this, the questions around, I think repatriation is very often how it's taught, but in, a, in the era we're living in at the moment, I'm a bit re reluctant to use that word. Um, who knows where we'll all be soon. But this idea of women being placed far away or close to their home area. Some women don't want to be. 
many women do want to be close to where they get support. It might be through family, it might be through services they've known before. But there's something quite fragmented about that, which actually may impact on what they can do. There's the, the phrase step down is often used. Medium to low, low to rehabilitation, and then step out, community placements and high support um, services for women with complex needs. So I just want to touch on two examples. Um, one is about, um, this was Essex, and I was invited to get involved in a, in a piece of work which came out of concerns of local commissioners. I think some of you are commissioners here today. Commissioners who were being having discussions with the medium secure unit called Brockfield House. And what they were finding was that there were actually quite a lot of women who could move, who were ready to move. And could they find places to move them to? Almost nothing, almost nothing. So in that locality, there was one service provided through a housing organization, which called itself high support um, therapeutic, but it was a mixed service. And they had very few women who were prepared to take that up because part of their transition was a sort of gentle re-entry, not a kind of, we'll throw you in at the deep end. So we spent a lot of time, uh, there were three elements to the work. There was a piece of a peer work. So this was women who'd had been ch discharged, talking to other women who wanted to leave or were ready to leave. We talked to quite a lot of people who were involved in the provision of services. And what mattered to women were the following. They wanted accommodation to meet their own needs, and that meant safety, support, not being isolated. That was a real concern for women, not being cut off. You know, a bed sits somewhere, and what, what then? Um, understanding through discussion what the options are, what the choices are, and how many moves it might involve, because it may not be a seamless move from your secure unit to your... Um, two-bedroomed flat with a little garden, uh, which, of course, many women talked about being the ideal, but was never <coughs> going to happen. But what was going to happen, they weren't always clear about. Clear information before discharge about support available, so that's mental health support, therapeutic support, opportunities for work and training, continuity. So how do you maintain continuity? And again, women who have moved from secure services have talked about that lack of continuity being really problematic. Who is holding the ring? Who's tying it all together? And who's helping them to establish their local links? And then regular opportunities to review progress, which were very important to them. Some would end up stuck in some kind of residential care. Some wouldn't leave the medium secure unit. Um, some private landlords would refuse to take women who were being discharged from Brockfield House because they said it was going to cause them problems. Very often the services weren't well integrated and it could mean that all that work that had taken place within the medium secure unit would be undone because of negatively reinforcing women's perhaps previous experience through kind of being what would be thrown at them once they were able to leave. So that was an example, and, and this was not an uncommon story um, a, around the country, and is still not an uncommon story. The other, the other um, project was with the high support. This is the one with the very long name. The Community-Based <coughs> Therapeutic Services for Women with Complex Needs. Um, what they were really trying to do, and again, some of you may be familiar with them. There's one in Crosby and one in Salford, so not too far away. And if you're interested, contact them, go and talk to them. Um, because there's, they're still there. They're still there. It hasn't expanded the provision, but those services that were set up um, are still there. So what they were trying to do was to provide opportunities for women to actually be somewhere which was outside the secure service in a locality, if you like, where they could be part of something that was both independent living and a place for themselves. Um, Thinking about creating communities, those were internal to the service as well as being part of local communities, focusing on recovery, thinking about positive risk management. And also for in the early days of these services, and this is about four or five years ago, actually understanding, and I think this was, was quite hard, 
uh, understanding that risk can often increase during transitional periods. And that was one of the arguments for trying to get more resources to go into that transitional period to enable the new service as well as the woman to make the transition well supported and with a kind of positive risk management approach. It hasn't been an easy journey. And interestingly, out of four that were set up, one didn't um, continue. Three have continued. They took very different approaches at the beginning. So one is actually referred to as a hospital. That's Garrow House in York. And the others are much more working from a sort of psycho-social model, if you like, where there are independent flats, but within a contained arena, if you like. So Salford has got flats built around a garden courtyard. Crosby is two or three terraced houses that from the front just look like terraced houses. And they basically took everything behind and rebuilt it as independent flats. And the importance for women talking about this, having a front door is absolutely phenomenal. Having a front door, not a room, not a bedroom, but a front door was just very, very important. And that, along with um, the, the relational security, having good planning in place, having coordination, all the things that that ideal scenario talks about. So, what are the gaps? Because there are still gaps. I don't think that I'm able to say um, that it's there yet. And there are gaps. So Annie Bartlett, again, you know, talks about um, women being still being far from home. There are not really placements that are suitable or available. We know some things about um, difficulties around care pathways. It's very complex. So it's not just that women have complex needs, but actually the system side of it is very complex as well. So you've got individual systems and then resources. And as we all know, we are probably seeing reduced resources and or being asked to think about how to make resources go further and achieve the kind of successful outcomes that are being looked for. There is some problem around lack of evidence. Um, and I think that's very important. I'd like to just touch on that before I finish about what really happens to women. What is that process about? It's been very limited. So again, there's quite a lot of evidence that is available, published, some of it will be clinical outcomes. Very little of it is actually what is that process about to stepping out and what happens then? And we don't know very much about it. So it's not just then about having provision, it's also about um, what, what happens to women and about how you can untangle, and I think that's a good word for it, untangle some of that process. So, where next? Further steps. Um, there are the factors that relate to women themselves. There are organisational inadequacies, as they've been described. And I'm not you know, saying that that's anybody's fault at all, because, but it just is what happens. It's difficult to provide here. There are some questions, and some of these have been raised by, uh, for example, the Centre for Mental Health, who, based on a report that they produced in 2011, raised these questions this year again. What's happening around service user, service recipient feedback in terms of measuring outcomes? Are mainstream mental health services including the range of women discharged? It's unclear at the moment. Is the recovery approach being promoted? Are commissioners purchasing needs-based provision? There's a, probably a need there for better understanding of patterns of care and then how decisions get made. And this is the kind of thing where, you know, in a perfect world, again, there'll be the resources to spend a lot of time understanding what goes on in the process. But actually, for most people, it's about trying to deliver a service and that has to be the priority. So the questions are there. I think they still need to be answered or asked and then answered. I don't think it's just about resources. It's about a number of other factors. And of course, as an evaluator and a researcher, I would say, I think we need more research. But that's not just about um, paying my salary or 
ge income generation for my organization, there is something that's happening that we just don't know that much about. We know quite a lot. What we don't really know is once women step out, what happens to their lives as a result of it. So I really just leave those questions with you. It was a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. As I said, no, no numbers today. Um, there are references in the presentation, and if you are interested in seeing any of the, the work that I have um, been involved in, all of it used to be on the Department of Health website, but has disappeared. I think every time they do a redesign, stuff moves. I don't know where to, but I'm very happy to perhaps um, send that to to Haley, and then if you want, would like it, you're very welcome. So thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.